Hello everyone and welcome to yet another webinar from Synergita. We bring expert views, opinions, industry best practices and practical tips on OKR. Let me start by giving introduction of today's guest, Roger Longton. Roger is a dog dad and the Avi Giants founder and chairman. He believes that when it comes to fueling performance, most businesses often fall short. So eight years ago, he made it his mission to help organizations build a stronger, more purposeful and outcome focused connection between the work its people and teams to do these strategic priorities. Since then, he's built up to TBG to become a global OKR consultancy, which delivers performance transformations for clients worldwide. He's also a qualified performance coach, a guest lecturer at MAB Business School, and is a leading international spokesman in the world of OKRs and the author of the OKR Coaches Handbook. You can tune in to hear Roger as he hosts the world's longest OKR podcast, Giant Talk where he talks about all aspects of OKRs with guests ranging from those who have been hands-on with them in numerous organizations to international thought leaders from organizations such as Harvard Business School. Now, without further ado, let's start the conversation. First of all, thank you so much, Roger, for joining us today. My pleasure, Mashima. Thank you for, uh, for, for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Roger. Now let's begin by exploring the benefits of implementing OKRs for small and medium enterprises. As businesses of all sizes continue to face new challenges, OKRs have emerged as a powerful tool for driving growth and success. So Roger, I would like you to tell us some, some of the key benefits of OKRs for small and medium enterprises. Yeah, so it, I don't know if anybody's kind of looked into the business and their giants a bit if they seen that I'm doing the podcast but you'll see there's names of quite big businesses on our um, on our website and that's fine we do work with large corporates now but we still work with smaller SME businesses that's where I grew the business from very much working in that sector so I've got a, a, a pretty good understanding of the challenges that growth presents as an organization as a business seeks to uh, you know seeks to scale up and so I've seen the challenges that they face and how OKRs can help with that. And uh, uh, what I would say is, as the organization grows, as there becomes perhaps um, more teams, more 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 management, um, leadership can become um, a bit, they end up being a bit further away from those that are actually doing the work on the front line, those that are delivering the value, those that are building the products or servicing the customers or, you know, the ones that are, are like I say, are, are, are building the value. And so there's a risk that there can be a, a misalignment that creeps in because the leadership is still, often the founders still um, have a very clear vision as to where they want to take the business. But those like I say, doing the work on the front line, the ones that are responsible for generating the value, um, might not necessarily get it because the way that they, that, that they are uh, helped to understand, the way they are supported to understand isn't quite as effective as it has been perhaps in the past where it was just kind of everybody in the same room in the same office who just got it, you know, because it was all part of regular day-to-day -day conversation, which is why, something like OKRs really, really helps because it starts to bring a degree of clarity. It helps provide the time and the space for people to get their heads around what the priorities of the business are and then work out what their contribution can be towards that. Um, so it starts to help them feel like they're part of the process and, uh, and that they're trusted in many respects to, to, uh, to, to be consulted, that they're valued, they want you know, leadership wants to hear those those opinions. But it's also not about creating something that's quite bureaucratic, quite uh, with the SMEs that we work with. They often say we don't want to become corporate. We, we you know, we've been agile. We've been quite adaptive. We've been quite responsive in the early stages and we don't want to lose that. That's our culture. That's what we really value. And so OKRs can bring in some light if you might say some light structure uh, and routine to to goal setting but it doesn't bring in a, a really if done well a really onerous bureaucratic process so it can still allow that that nice balance of 
the business if it needs to kind of change in direction quite quickly but at the same time people kind of know where they're at and know what is clear and know how they align absolutely but once an organization decides to implement okrs how can they determine when it's the right time to start start scaling up their okrs yeah so building on what i was just saying i think the trigger point and this is what i saw as 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 organizations grew it wasn't necessarily a, 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 a certain revenue threshold. It was more to do with, um, in part, the number of people in the business, but in particular, I would say the complexity of the organization. So if you're starting to have multiple teams, especially across multiple locations, um, then it, 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 you're increasing the risk of that misalignment starting to creep in. And it's that point at which I think a, a, a business really, really benefits from from OKRs. I mean, we've we've helped businesses with thirty or forty people. Recently, we worked with a client who who had a hundred people, um, in addition to the you know five, six, ten thousand as well. But the the they got to a hundred, and they started to see that complexity come in. They'd started to see things that were happening in the organisation, misunderstandings. Uh, that was starting to slow the speed of delivery and the speed of execution down. And that's why they turned to OKRs because they went, hang on a second, we used to be really slick at this. We need to get back on track. So perhaps we need to do things a bit differently. Um, so, yeah, I would say it's more to do with the complexity of where they're at with the organization. Of course, cross-functional teams and collaboration plays a very important role in scaling yeah. up OKRs. But yeah. can you walk us through the five tips that you mentioned for scaling up OKRs? Yeah. So, I mean, this was the headline of the of the of the webinar. So, um, yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share a, a, an image with everyone because I'm going to use this to talk through as we uh, as we do. So, hopefully, you can all see this what we call the rainbow. Okay. Um, and when we are asked by clients, how does everything fit together? You know, how does everything, uh, uh, are, are all the kind of, especially when you're looking at the performance of the business, the performance of the organization, how do things slot together? Well, first of all, what I would suggest you do is have a look at your business and take a judgment on the balance between the two different types of performance that exist to some extent in, in all organizations. And those two types of performance are tactical and adaptive performance. Now, the tactical performance is the kind of performance which we're mostly familiar with. It's very much target driven. It's driven by um, uh, uh, usually a, a focus on, 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 a, on a KPI, for instance, and it's, you know, in this, in this context, you can see me ring, ring uh, highlighting business as usual over there. It's often associated with keeping the organization running, keeping it healthy. OK. The other type of performance that exists in the business is what we call adaptive performance. And that's the focus on the things which transform the business, that take it forward, that grow it. Now, you see in terms of the rainbow here you'll see that we've got a whole heap of activity going on to do with okrs on this side which i'll go into in a little bit more detail in a second uh, but also in relation to perhaps continuous improvement activity uh, over on the uh, on, on improving the business as usual you might actually see okrs emerge in that space as well so that's the first thing I'd suggest that, they, uh, that, that, that you take a good balance because the, the reason is that, that some organizations would be perhaps more um, uh, uh, weighted towards the adaptive because they're at an early growth stage or they're a highly innovative organization, whereas some other organizations might be more weighted towards the tactical because actually their strategy is to um, pretty much uh, maintain good quality delivery um, and there isn't really a huge amount of scope for innovation and change in there it may, maybe they're in a very mature sector of a marketplace in which case um, that's uh, that's fine um, so that's the first thing the second thing is I would say define uh, or when you if, if you decide you want to use OKRs 
all the books and all the most of the blog posts talk about hard alignment so this is what we would call hard alignment so i'm kind of highlighting in through a, a rather rough arrow point there but that's what we would call hard alignment so you start off with your vision and strategy uh and then you distill that down into priorities over three to five years and then you distill those down into strategic okay what well what we call strategic okrs which are usually 12 month okrs and then to align into those you then create usually three or four month uh, transformational OKRs and then sometimes you may actually take those down into three and four month tactical OKRs. That's what we call hard alignment because each one is aligned into a parent. It is a parent-child relationship between between those uh, those OKRs. There is still scope for people within or and, and other teams in the organization that might not exist or might not actually have a direct contribution to still have OKRs, they can uh, 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 own or develop for themselves and own what we call innovation OKRs, which is perhaps where they have a great idea about how they could possibly contribute towards the what's in the strategic OKRs, but they're not hard aligned like the ones in this section here. Okay, so it, by by Doing it that way, you're allowing um, everyone to have a chance of working with OKRs, but not, not expecting everybody to work with OKRs. And that's really important because coming to my third recommendation, um, and that is uh, make sure that um, you don't have too many. You know, um, think of your OKRs as quite a scarce resource that you you know you spend them you put them to work where they're going to have the greatest impact we've had loads of clients that have come to us uh, who have tried to set them up and that what they've done is they've set them up for every everything every single activity in the business everybody's owned one for themselves and the whole thing just becomes bureaucratic as i said earlier and and it just collapses under its own weight and and okrs fail as a, as a way of working so to keep it agile keep it nimble keep it light make sure you don't have too many so that's the third point fourth point is i would say make sure you bring in cross-functional working into how you define and how you build up your okrs and how you work with them and usually for us, that comes at the tr the transformational level. So you've usually got leadership owning the strategic OKRs, and then the next level down to help develop the transformational ones. What you do is you ask, um, what is it we should be doing as an organisation to overcome the challenges or meet the challenges that the strategic OKRs pose for us? And the difference is you're not asking what can each department do, because as soon as you ask what each department can do, everybody scurries off into their departments and you end up with a load of siloed activity. And we've had a lot of clients that have come to us and said, we're not doing it right. We're struggling. You know, that that even even just that organization of 100 people that I mentioned a few minutes ago, they were already starting to experience siloed working, which was what was slowing down their speed of execution. So it's really important that you build in cross-functional working into the the way that you work with your okrs um and that's that's the fourth one and my fifth tip um is to build some light touch governance around it governance is a bit of a um a, a corporate term but really it's it, it's nothing uh, it's nothing to be to be scared of it's about everybody being on the same page as to how they're going to work with OKR so consciously sitting down and designing before you jump in with OKRs how you're going to use them as an organization because just writing them means nothing changes it's what you do with them once you've got them that makes the difference so actually you know pausing for thought before you leap into OKRs and working through what it is that you're going to do with them once you've got them 
and uh, you know what are the habits the routines how are you going to manage them how are you going to review them how are you going to re review and reset them you know because there's there's obviously a cyclical pattern to them so some really really important it, it's really important to put some governance around it but just obviously don't create a beast just keep it nice and right touch so there you go those 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 are my five tips indeed a very practical and tectonic tips aligning yeah. okas within organizations overall strategy is very crucial but i would also like you to share some insights on how okas can be aligned within an organization's overall strategy to ensure that employees are working towards the right objectives okay so it starts with uh, you know you've got to align in you've got to have a clear strategy to start with okay uh, and I'd be able to identify within that the key strategic themes. Now, the strategy is likely to have a time frame of probably five years, maybe a bit more. Um, but identify the themes within that and then work out what your priorities are for the coming for the coming year, for the next 12 months. Um, and then allowing, as I said earlier, allowing the time for those that need to align into those uh, strategic OKRs, the time to work it out for them to understand what's in it, what's what's being uh, what asked of them, and then giving them the time to kind of work out how they can contribute towards that uh, and and effectively solve the problem for themselves. And this is this is a really important. Um, difference to, uh, 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 to, to to an approach which I hear time and time again when it comes to OKRs is we need to cascade them. Don't, for God's sake, cascade them because that is when uh, people, that's when leaders write the OKRs for everybody else and that's not OKRs. That's just the way performance management has been done for decades and there's a reason why people want to change it because it just doesn't work. It doesn't create ownership doesn't deliver a sense of purpose, it doesn't uh, create a sense of empowerment or, or imply a, a degree of trust either. Um, but yeah, give them time to work out how they align into it because that's where the mindset shift starts to take place. You start to see light bulbs come on and because people start to see different ways perhaps of solving a problem which they've been faced with for quite a while. So you know, you start to see some innovation actually come to the surface. So it's really important to allow allow the time and space for that to happen. Also, Roger, leadership certainly plays a very important role in planning, organizing, directing, and in implementation of OKRs. But how can leaders ensure that OKRs are very effectively implemented and used in the right employee performance? Yeah, so absolutely critical that leadership are involved from day one even before day one if we think of day one as to when they go live leadership needs to be involved before that because they need to be involved in 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 uh, sort of leading the program and sp especially sponsoring the program of getting okrs in place um at focus should be more on team performance though rather than individual performance certainly when it comes to okrs because okrs are a team sport um and if there is to be a link to individual performance uh in terms of performance assessment and performance appraisal it's really important to be clear about that right from the start and our in our experience if you're going to link them do not link a, uh, a directly between um, uh, uh, key result achievements and somebody's pay or bonus. It, it, it's, it's far more uh, effective to create uh, a behavioural assessment around, you know, are people approaching and working with their OKRs in the right way to bring about the type of performance that you're looking for? Because as soon as you tie it directly to um, uh, to, to a key result, uh, uh achievement then it's going to require um uh people well it's going to encourage people to play it safe because they're not going to want to take a risk try something new really stretch themselves because they might they may fall short and falling short is part of working with okrs because that's where the learning and the adaptation comes from so 
yeah, you've got to be really careful with how if if you do try and link it to performance. Yeah. Right. And scaling up OCAS can come with its own set of challenges. Now, what are some common mistakes an organizations make when trying to scale up their OCAS? Yeah, so I, I might have touched upon a couple of these already, but what I'd say is do not cascade them, as I said before. That, that in, in my experience, is when um, you know leadership and management write write them for the next level down oh and I was talking to someone earlier today who said that they still see examples of where um, the key results at one level forms the objective at the next level that's that is not OKRs that does not work you are severely limiting your um, your, your uh, potential for uh, for, for innovation and empowerment if you do that if you work in that way and that is absolutely not how okrs should work um trying to i think one of one of the um one of the other mistakes that we see is that um uh, there's a rush to reset the okrs perhaps from one quarter to the next and that they don't allow enough time and what then happens is leadership then end up writing them for everybody because that's the quick and easy way to do it Again, you know, you're really missing out on a lot of potential value there if you if if you if you if you don't plan ahead and make the time to to work on the reset. Um, also, I think I would say um, some of our clients have uh, opted not to go with quarterly cycles. They've actually opted to go with four month cycles, which is uh, the name of a four month cycle is quadrimester. So we call them quads for short. Um, and and to be honest that is uh, working really well for them because it allows the teams a little bit longer to get stuck into the okrs and the organization is happy to go with just three resets a year instead of four um fine there's no you know okay you read the books and most of them talk about quarters it doesn't matter it's about what what's right for your organization i wouldn't go any longer than four months because i think you can start to lose momentum then um but uh yeah you know don't doggedly stick to just three month cycles if it, because that's what you might have read in, in in some of the books and also as well i'd say my final one is mandating that everyone in the organization should have an okr everyone in the business should have an okr um, that forces more to be created than is necessary. It often forces ones to be created that are um, really of no impact and no importance. You know, it comes back to the point that I said earlier about uh, be careful where you spend your OKRs because, you know, they are there to create focus. They are there to drive attention. And if, if, if you're spreading them really far and wide, then it's going to be difficult for people to understand where they should be focusing their attention. Absolutely. But I would also want you to share your insights on how can organizations use OKRs to foster a culture of continuous improvement and learning? Okay, so I think OKRs are fantastic for um, uh, experimentation. Um, you know, this is where you get the chance to create an OKR around an idea, that uh, you want to test or a hypothesis that you want to try and prove or disprove. Um, there is a degree of risk in that because it might fall short. It might not actually work as you, as, as you expected. So it's important that that risk is not something which is so extreme that it, ex that it, it, you know, it, it jeopardizes the business. So that risk needs to be contained. It needs to be, in 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 my view, um, kind of approved that you can try that experiment, so to speak. Um, and what we see works really well is that if you have an exec or a leadership sponsor uh, for for at obviously you've got an owner of a strategic OKR, a 12 month OKR, usually if that when it comes to resetting between quarters or, th or four months if you're working on that then they get to see as a sponsor for that for that for all the work that's going on in support of their that you know their 12 month okay they get to see what's been drafted and it's really down to them to say actually that looks a little bit too reckless or a little bit too dangerous for us to try 
can we try and you know contain that 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 a little bit more um so it's them that should really have final say so yeah you know the teams or uh, the, the 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 teams get to create and draft draft up that okr but it still needs that kind of executive leadership um check and balance to make sure that it's 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 going to have the impact that they want it to have that it's it's fully aligned with what it it needs to support right also balancing the need for accountability with the need for experimentation and risk taking is important when scaling up okrs how can an organization strike this balance effectively yeah so um it, it, how can they strike that balance so it it's it, it, it it's about um creating like i said that 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 balance of risk taking making sure that it's contained i mean there should always be a cycle of of uh, uh, this is what i was saying before about adaptive performance that they have that test learn and adapt approach that's how you make the incremental improvements and really drive you know the the capabilities the performance and ultimately the growth of the business and the people and the teams within the business let's not forget that everybody wins when we're when we're trying new things out um but it, it's it, it's really important that you have kind of uh, uh that, that you have a, a culture or a, a safe culture in which people are not um uh uh uh, you know berated people are not uh, penalized for for falling short because if they fall short that's when the learning is and that's when you can you can move forward so in terms of um uh, containing those risks it's about making sure that if it's if it's worth taking a risk and and ultimately it doesn't come off it's about making sure that there is evidence that we have learned from that and that is then applied next time around okay um, and it's down to the executive sponsor really to to, uh, to to ensure that that if something does fall short that that learning has had an impact you know moving forward right are there any industries or types of organizations that are particularly well suited for scaling up okas and why yeah so it would be really easy for me to say a tech you know a te technology business a software business for instance but there are so many businesses nowadays that you would call technology anyway you know a lot of traditional sectors are having to uh, you know embrace technology to transform the way that they work and that their their business models operate. Um, so I would say no. Actually, it's of equal importance to all sectors. The key is in, is understanding the balance between the tactical and adaptive performance you have in your organisation, and making sure that you use OKRs versus the other side of the equation, which is often KPIs, uh, in the right way to drive the overall organizational performance that you want to see so it's less so much about the, the industry types and more about looking at your business to see actually if we've got a load of uh, uh change and transformation work going on then we really we need we need probably need to have more focus on on okrs than we do than we do kpis but if we're like i said a more mature business that is in a more steady state then it might be the other way Absolutely. Training and support are essential for effective implementation and management of OKRs. And what kind of training or support do you recommend for SMEs to help them effectively implement and manage their OKRs? Okay, so a really interesting point because we do um, uh, research every couple of years to, to look at how OKRs are, are being used out there and to help those that uh, and produce a report which which can inform those that um, haven't perhaps you know started using them you know they want so they can learn from the experience of others and one of the things that we looked at in the last report was the uh, the, the the speed of change in different size of organizations the speed at which okrs got up to uh, speed got up to effectiveness 
and and what was interesting was that in the smaller organizations it was a lot quicker uh, than large organizations now um and also we we looked at whether they whether a small organization had a, a degree of change management in place whether they consciously managed it or whether they just went let's just do this it's starting on monday um interestingly the smaller organizations uh, didn't really have much change management in place, but yet RAP got OKRs got OKRs up and running more rapidly than the than the larger organisations. So really, what I take from that is perhaps if you're still a relatively small SME, I don't know, up to 50 people, you might not necessarily need to think too too majorly about change management. Yes, you still need to communicate it. You still need to talk about um, the benefits of OKRs, but in terms of if, if you're a larger organization, it becomes more complex. There are more things which are going on in the business which OKRs are going to interface with. And it's really important to have the answers to those questions before you get started, because otherwise they could become objections in the wider audience and people could, and that then makes it more difficult to get people on board. So if you are a larger SME, and SMEs, I'm, I'm not too sure in India, but SMEs here in the UK are up to 250 people. And if you are up to 250 people, then I would say definitely you need to be thinking about change management. Uh, you need to be thinking about who's going to be impacted, how, what questions might they have, how can we answer those, uh, sell it to them, convince them uh, of the benefits. Uh, and nurture progress. So when you see the green shoots, when you see the um, uh, the, uh, uh, the the signs that it's working, really good examples of practice. You really champion that and make it visible to the whole organisation. Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier about the importance of introducing a bit of governance. Um, this a part and parcel of that is 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 everybody getting on the same page around language uh, so uh, first of all <laughs> and it may sound um, pretty uh, pretty basic but it is it, it is really important for people to get their head around the difference between an objective and a key result that goes without saying but then there will also be the way that um, OKRs integrate with perhaps your existing planning process or, or any other process. If, you, if you're a, a product business, you'll have road mapping, um, you'll have your agile sprints quite possibly, and, and it's kind of saying, right, well, how, does, how do OKRs fit in with all that as well? So developing a shared language around OKRs is really important. And finally, what I would say is, to make sure that OKRs continue, that they don't run out of steam and just become, you know, that 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 new fad which didn't last, it's important to invest in building up some internal expertise. Now, uh, of course, we can help with that. We we have a, an OKR Coach Academy, uh, which whenever we do an implementation with a client, we always train uh, a cohort of coaches for them. Uh, and uh, we, the, the training for the coaches doesn't just focus on uh, the method of OKRs, it also focuses very much on the people aspect of OKRs because OKRs can fail because they, you know people don't buy into them, people don't work with them in the, in, 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 in the best way. So the people side of it is really important. So the third thing I would say there is make sure you build up um, some internal capability so that you've got uh, coaches on hand who can help facilitate teams as they work through uh, a cycle and also when you go from one cycle to the other or one year to the next that they can help with that that it's not just left to the teams to do it for themselves because the facilitation is worth its weight in gold when it comes to those types of activities right but in a rapidly rapidly changing business landscape how can organizations ensure that the okas are agile enough to adapt to changes in the market or the business landscape as they scale up yeah so that comes back to um how you design your framework you know i said 
earlier, you know, take take pause before you before you leap in, uh, and and think about how do we work with them? How often should we should our cycles run for? Should they be three months? Should they be four months? It is worth just saying though that if you start with one, there's no reason why you can't change to another. It's not set in stone, but just define what your starting point is. Um, and uh, and also what I would say is when I, I talked about the cross-functional aspect, the real value in sort of work, breaking through, making sure that you're not becoming really just functionally focused, you, you, you have that cross-functional horizontal working, that horizontal alignment. Um, that may require groups of people to come together that don't usually work together or haven't worked together yet. And so there is some training, I think, which is worth doing with those people to help them form as a team really quickly. So in other words, spool up really quickly. And then when you get to the end of that OKR, when it's uh, when it's um, come to the end of its, uh, excuse me, its life cycle, then for them to be able to stand down rapidly. So it's what we call rapid rapid team forming and collaboration. Uh, so they don't have to spend ages, you know, getting to know each other, working out how it's going to work, and so on and so forth. They can get stuck in relatively quickly um, as as a new group coming together. So I think that that helps with you know being able to uh, stand up and stand down quite quickly. Absolutely, I agree with you. Also, I would like you to share your insights on how can organisations ensure that their OKRs are focused on long-term value creation rather than short-term gains as they're scaling up. Yeah, so it, again, this this comes down to um, you absolutely need, you know, I've talked about strategic 12-month OKRs, I've then talked about transformational and tactical, which can exist at three or four-month um, timeframes. Um, it, it is very important to have those that hard alignment in place um because without that it, it then it just doesn't work there's no connection there's no clear uh, 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 contribution that's being made no clear sort of uh, set the, uh, purpose to 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 you know a a a, a shorter term objective that perhaps is, is, is has been put together so um it's really down to uh, the exec sponsor, as I said, you know, usually that would be somebody that is involved in or perhaps even the owner of the strategic OKR to uh, ensure that what's being set that aligns into that uh, in the shorter term is, is going to be creating and delivering the value which um, they need to help move the needle on their, on their 12 month OKR. So, um, I still see some organizations that actually don't have them at 12 month level that are just going, right, we're going to do this for the next three months and then we're going to do this for the next three months and then this for the next, and that leadership are the ones making the decisions on, on that basis. But it doing it that way, um, it means that you, you don't have that long term value creation focus. It means that you, you're kind of quite, you're quite tactical and quite reactive, which in some respects, has its advantages but in terms of being able to instill a sense of a, a sense of purpose and a sense of uh, alignment just just kind of running from quarter to quarter with no uh longer term okrs is 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 not a great way to use them it's not a great way at all right but ensuring that okrs focus on long-term value creation rather than short-term gains is certainly crucial and what are some best practices for prioritizing and focusing on key OKRs? Okay, so um, first and foremost, it's about habits. It's about getting into a, a regular routine of once you've got your OKRs, checking in against them and uh, uh, making sure that there's a regular drumbeat about around their focus. So usually, if a if a if a if, if a, an OKR squad, an OKR team are working on, a, on an OKR, usually that check-in would be every two weeks. That's what we tend to find is it, some some organizations up for a week, depends on the nature of it. Um, but typically we find every two weeks 
and then working out at leadership level how long how often they then check in against the progress that that the uh, that, that the shorter term okrs are, are making and that often tends to be um every month so it, it there is a, a need to kind of get the right sequence of events running throughout the quarter uh, uh to, to make sure that that all works um making sure that there is uh, visible leadership interest, tangible leadership interest, and I don't mean that they are standing up and talking about them at a presentation. What what I mean by that is that when they're passing people at the coffee machine or in the in in the canteen, that they are, you know, asking them how's your OKRs going, how do you find working with them, you know, that sort of thing, because it's it's that kind of um, uh, 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 casual conversation around them, which makes th really helps to uh, make them commonplace. Uh, so yeah, that that leadership, visible leadership interest, is really important. And something a little bit more logical, a little bit more pragmatic is um, when you're uh, when you're planning your OKRs for the next period, map them out across your organisation. OK, think about the different uh, different uh, departments and teams and so on and so forth and map them out across your organization and score the level of uh, contribution that they need to uh, that each area needs to make to each OKR. And that really helps you build up a, 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 a visual uh, map, if you will, of how, how much Contrib contribution each area needs to make so you can then take a call to see whether that area has the resource uh, to meet what's being asked of it and also it helps to inform where you want to where you need to pull in as i said from a cross-functional point of view where you need to pull in those contributors from to to help form the next level of okrs uh, so that's a that's that's a really important activity that's well worth doing at the end, uh, you know, at the end of a setting up um, uh, for, for, for the next quarter, for instance. Indeed, prioritization and focus are important as an organization scales up its OKR. Besides this, what are some potential roadblocks that an organization may encounter while scaling up their OKRs and how can they overcome them? So in many respects, it's kind of the reverse of what we've been talking about. So the risks of not doing what I've, 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 I've suggested. So if you're not managing the change, that can derail things. Uh, if you don't put training in place, that means that perhaps doesn't become that common understanding and common language. Uh, if you're not building up that team of internal expertise and training up those coaches, then you're just leaving it usually to managers to try and keep it running. And they, they're very busy people and have lots of other things to be cracking on with. Um, and and um, if if you if you fall into the trap of asking what can each function do uh, to help us uh, with our OKRs, that's when you create the silos and you then don't get that cross-functional working. And strategic priorities very rarely fit neatly into one into one function. They usually require, you know, if you're creating a product, for instance, you'd be bringing together uh, people from multiple functions, from technology, to from sales, from uh, delivery from uh, uh, marketing, you know, you need a multidisciplinary team to get that uh, developed and take it to market. So if you don't do that, then you're missing a massive trick. OKR is such an important tool for an organization. If you can share any specific example of how OKR have helped organizations achieve significant growth or transformation. Yeah. So. Um, I mentioned before we had a, a, a client recently that uh, only had 100 people, but they were a technology business, so they they'd been around for a number of years, um, and um, it, that 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 ratio between revenue and, and headcount was, as as it often is for uh, 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 technology businesses, kind of um, uh, uh, didn't. Um, necessary, they, they had a very high revenue for, for a relatively small headcount. Anyway, still 100 people, um, and 
um, they had started to experience um, silos. Uh, there was already confusion that was uh, starting to creep in around what the priorities were, lack of lack of clarity around that, and so on. And they were going for their next round of funding. And when they put their OKRs in place, uh, the the um, investors were actually super impressed by the level of of clarity and focus uh, and collaboration that 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 uh, bringing OKRs into the business had had helped them to develop. Um, so whilst that necessarily wasn't about um, using OKRs directly or certainly in the short term to drive, you know, drive growth, what it did was it helped them secure the funding. So that is that is super important. Um, a slightly larger organisation that we worked with, a telecommunications business here in the UK. Um, they had problems with um, uh, functional working. Yeah, they had people who were who were, were very much in their functions and didn't step outside those areas, and that really slowed down the speed of execution. It actually created quite a lot of conflict, um, fighting over resources and so on and so forth. And so, the 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 um, uh, uh, the move to kind of creating the cross-functional teams. Uh, to work on transformational OKRs was was a breakthrough, and it rapidly accelerated their their uh, speed of execution and time to market for new products as well. Thanks, Roger. Before we move to our last question, I would request all the participants to share any questions, queries, or concerns you may have in the chat box. We'll try to take all the questions. Now, seeking towards our final question, could you give us a sneak peek into an upcoming trends or developments in the world of OKRs that small and medium enterprises should be aware of as they scale up? Yeah, so um, I think the first thing to mention is AI. You know, chat G GPT has been everywhere over the past few months, and AI is starting to creep into um, OKR software. My I mean, I, I'm not. <laughs> I don't want to stand in the way of progress here, but I think it, we need to put a health warning on it because, um, from what I've seen, how it's been marketed, it's been marketed as it will write your OKRs for you. Now, that is um, for me a uh, a dangerous position to be in because, first of all, is it really uh, allowing for a degree of innovation, creativity, problem solving, that sort of thing. Secondly, it's very easy to just take what it suggests and cascade that through the business, which was exactly what I was talking about earlier, that is definitely not the thing to do. So I think that is really, really important to, uh, to, 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 to bear in mind. And AI, I think, is something which it is is it's in it we've got a risk of overusing it as a marketing term when in fact it perhaps isn't so i think we need to we need to be careful that we're not um seduced if you will by promises of you know labor saving time saving and so on and so forth you save time you might you will pay a cost elsewhere and that cost could be that people don't get the chance to create the alignment, to have to be able to problem solve, to to uh, to come up with the new ways of solving those challenges that you've got, which um, which, which um, AI certainly as it stands at the moment wouldn't be able to do. Um, the other thing is um, this is not so much directly uh, for OKRs, but I think uh, I, I have seen it work quite well with OKRs. Is we're seeing better technology uh, around um, uh, communication and feedback tools in organizations that allow for rapid feedback and rapid response rather than you know filling in a employee feedback survey once every six months or something like that and if you're implementing okrs you could use those tools you can use those tools around the project to, to understand how it's going and how people are receiving it and then 
you know, as soon as you receive something in, which is a really great piece of feedback, you can actually you can actually respond to that uh, uh, pretty much instantly, rather than having to even wait until the end of the current course. If that's something you might be able to change, you know, in, in just a matter of days, rather than waiting until you know um, waiting another couple of months until the end of the quarter. So, um, I think these these <coughs> excuse me these feedback tools, which are helping with the democratization, I suppose, of, of communication in organizations is are really, really helpful for OKR projects. Thanks, Roger. We have got a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, so I'll be reading out the first question we have received from Ajay. And the question is, how do you handle situations where teams or individuals consistently fail to achieve their OKRs? while still maintaining a positive and supportive environment. Okay, so that's a that's an interesting question, AJ. Um, I would uh, I'm curious as to as to whether it's the same OKR that they keep failing at, um, or if the OKR is is being um, uh, revised, uh, rewritten, um, or if it's a, a completely different one. So. Um, and also, I'd be curious about the nature of the OKR. If it was an, if if they are incredibly ambitious or incredibly experimental, then actually not not hitting 100% or even 80%, it could well be um, what you would expect, uh, as long as there is learning that plays forward, that is that that then is taken forward and kind of. In, informs, uh, influences the design of the OKR for the next quarter. If it's, if they are considered to be easily achievable, um, and, and or or if it's the same one which from one quarter to the next they keep failing on, then there is there is there is a performance issue which need which you will never solve through just using OKRs. There's a there's a, a performance issue which needs to be tackled. Uh, you know, their line manager needs to be spending some time with them to understand what's going on. Is it conduct? Is it capability? Um, and you know, following whatever uh, policies that you have in place uh, for managing performance, individual performance on that basis. Right. Thanks, Roger. We have second question from Mohan Prabhu, and the question is. With the rise of remote work and virtual collaboration, what are some best practices for using technology to build and maintain strong team dynamics and communications? Okay, so I'm going to assume that you mean in relation to working with OKRs here, because you know general collaboration and, and team working is is you know uh, is is quite broad. But if you've got a team working with OKRs here, then this is where. Uh, I mean, we're big, big fans of using systems, um, not necessarily any one particular system because different different systems do different things and, and suit different clients. Um, but the value of using an OKR system over, for instance, using Google Sheets is, is significant. Unless you're just talking about one team that's working with a couple of OKRs, Google Sheets become useless very, very quickly. Uh, and that is what uh, can slow things down. And if you've got a, if you've got a good a good system, which is a, a way in which people can record progress, can actually comment on, can tag each other, can can work in uh, in that way, then that's super important. But then the system itself is not enough. What you need are are some uh, some good routines around that. So if there's a if there's an, an actual scoring of progress and confidence, perhaps once a fortnight, if the team are remote, then I would expect them probably to be maybe having some uh, some some more regular stand-ups rather than just once a fortnight, where they are talking about the more tactical activities which are going on, but then they do their scoring perhaps once a fortnight. So in some respects, it's kind of working on a sprint basis if you will um and kind of getting into the routine of of of, 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 of sprinting every every two weeks um so hope that helps that's right we have another question from molly johnston 
and he is asking what's the biggest challenge there be giants come up against with clients implementing okrs and how important is culture when it comes to embedding okrs uh, so i'm going to put this these two questions together because it is culture <laughs> the biggest challenge is often culture uh, and we when when a client approaches us or when a when a prospect approaches us uh, about working with them we do kind of do a bit of a sense check on their culture to see if if they if it's a very command and control uh, very dictatorial type culture then we we have to you know we there have been times where we've actually said look we think you need to to work on these following uh, the, the, these specific aspects of your culture before OKRs, uh, uh, before you put OKRs in place, because otherwise nothing's going to change, um, and it's just going to feel like wh however you've used goal setting in the past, just but just under a different name. So uh, uh, you know, culture is is absolutely really important, and I would say it's it's often often the biggest challenge in the in the early stages uh, when a when a uh, prospect approaches us. Thanks, Roger. We have our last question uh, by Paul Joseph. The question is, how do I ensure that OKRs are transparent and visible to all stakeholders? And what are some tools and technologies that can support OKRs tracking and reporting? OK, so um, really good question. Um, what I would say, Paul, is, yeah, I mean, OKRs by default should be transparent but not always because there could be commercially sensitive ones, uh, ones that perhaps to do with um, acquisition of new businesses, uh, ones to do with uh, or, uh, uh, reorganization. Um, we even worked with um, some, some leadership teams recently who haven't actually wanted to sh publicly share um, you know the headline numbers for the business because they was they were concerned that that would um, perhaps go out to uh, find its way to competitors. Okay, fine, you know. But um, the point is that it that having uh, managing your OKRs in a system is really uh, is is the best way to give transparency to those that need to see it. So you, not just the uh, employees, you can put stakeholders into that system. If you've got investors, for instance, they can have access to the system. And a lot of systems uh, have different levels of access. So they may just have read-only access, which uh, you know would might be suitable for for an investor, for instance. Um, and you know, I've got to say, you know, you, you've got to speak to the guys at uh, Synergita to, uh, you know, to, to 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 be talking about OKR tracking because they do that, and that's and that's great. Um, and uh, yeah, so you know, have a chat with them and, um, and and see how they do for you. Thank you so much, Roger, for sharing your expertise with us. Also, Roger, I wanted to reach out and ask if you can tell me more about your longest running OKR podcast. Your insights and experience in this area are invaluable. And I would love to hear more about your thoughts and strategies for achieving success with OKRs. Also, how can one listen to a podcast and stay updated on latest topics? Yeah, so um, we've got we've, we've got giant talk. So if you just search for that in, in, in your uh, in your podcast uh, platform, you will find it. Um, it's been running now since uh, late 2018. So, you know, we've been going for four years. Um, we talk about all sorts of different aspects to do with uh, OKRs um, and and things that can have impact on OKRs, like culture and change and, and so on and so forth. But looking at them from different points of view, different parts of the business, um, seeing how they fit with innovation, how they can drive innovation. So huge amount. And there's also plenty of stories there from um, organizations that have taken the leap, tried to do them, and what they've learned as a result. So if you're looking for, you know, to, to learn from those that have already trodden that path, then, you know, ha have a listen and you, 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 can find, you can find them in there. I'll also be... Um, uh, um, I've also provided to, to Mishuma um, the uh, uh, some some resources which, if you wish to uh, 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 download, you're very welcome to. 
a couple of uh, guides, uh, a brief introduction guide, a beginner's guide as well. Uh, and then we've got uh, uh, some uh, further information on um, uh, creating the right culture for OKRs and then also on uh, what to do with o it, it, how you can use OKRs in a recession as well, because obviously a lot of economies around the world are facing a slowdown, slow down, excuse me, at the moment. So um, Mishima will share that with everyone in, an, in a follow-up email, so you'll be able to just download those if you if you want to. And there's also my contact details will be in there as well if you wish to get in touch after this. Absolutely. Thank you, Roger, once again for your time and sharing your expertise with us. I look forward to hearing back, you, back from you soon. Also, thank you to all the registrants. We hope that you found this session very informative and valuable. We'll be back with another interesting topic on another day. Until then, cheers. Thank you, everyone.